Cool. Welcome, Lisa, to our um, weekly seminar series here in Haifa. Sorry that it's virtually. We really sincerely hope that we will come, that you will come one day. It's a beautiful city. Um, so for everybody, we are welcoming today Professor Lisa McNeil, whose main research interests are active tectonics, rifting, subduction zones, earthquakes, and tsunami hazards, fault properties, and interac interaction between tectonic sedimentation and climate. Professor McNeil teaches undergrad and master students in a range of modules and field trips. Her education uh, was a BA at Cambridge University in Natural Sciences and a PhD at Oregon State University studying the Cascadia subduction zone. This was followed by a Dorothy Hodging Royal Society Fellowship at the University of Leeds, and then moving to the University of Southampton. She has considerable involvement of in IODP, International Ocean Discovery Program, and uh, co-chief scientist on several expeditions on the different railing platforms, and currently co-chair of the Science Evaluation Panel for IODP. She was awarded the Coke Medal by the Geological Society of London in 2020. So uh, today we are very honored to host uh, Professor Lisa McNeil uh, from the School of Ocean and uh, Earth Sciences at the University of Southampton in the UK with a talk uh, entitled Analyzing Rapid High Resolution Active Ra Rift Processes in the Current Rift, Greece. So Lisa, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for a, a very, very nice um, introduction. And thank you for the invitation to give a seminar. And I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. But as you say, hopefully one day uh, it would be very nice to visit. And I did want to add before I start just my my thoughts to everyone in the region who's been um, who is being affected by by the current situation. And hopefully it'll end positively soon. Um, OK, I shall share my screen and we shall start. So. Okay, can everybody see? Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about the Corinth Rift in Greece, so not too far from you in the eastern Mediterranean, um, and giving you a summary of some of the work that we've been doing over the last, um, well, quite a while, um, but particularly over the last sort of five to ten years or so. Um, and this is in collaboration with lots of different people, um, but I've sort of particularly singled out um, Donna Shillington, Casey Nixon, and Rob Gorthorpe but also, also all of those who participated in the recent drilling expedition um, that we did in 2017. Okay, so why are we interested in the early rift phase, which is what we have here in Corinth? Um, so many people are interested in rift processes, both from a sort of hazards and a resources perspective, but often we tend to look at more mature um, rift systems. But by studying young active rifts, which there are not actually that many worldwide, it gives us potential to really understand better that early rift history, which is often deeply buried in more mature systems. One thing that's particularly poorly constrained is often the sort of rate of processes, and that comes from strain rates, as in sort of tectonic types of processes, through to sediment flux rates, so um, more sort of physical um, processes at the surface. So there's a real need for chronological data. Um, and there's a couple of sort of areas that we're particularly interested in. And one of them is how um, faults and fault networks develop to control subsidence and developments of deeper centers in rift basins. And then secondly, how do um, tectonics and climate interact to control the flux of sediment into a basin? And what factor dominates and on what sort of time scales? So there are lots of processes that we don't really understand well, um, but we have the potential to do that at really quite high resolution here in the Corinth Rift. So the Corinth Rift is in central Greece, just to the west of Athens. Um, so as I say, not too far from you. It's an area of um, a region of general extension in the Aegean, and it has some of the highest strain rates and extension rates of the whole world. So up to 15 to 20 millimeters per year and very high levels of seismicity. It's also a very young rift. Um, so probably no more than about 5 million years in the recent phase beginning about 2 million years ago. 
So as a result, it has a relatively simple tectonic history, which makes it easier to understand. There's also very high sedimentation rates and it's sitting close to sea level. So we can use that sea level reference frame to understand vertical motions. The sedimentary record of rifting is very well preserved, um, particularly offshore, but also onshore. And it's also a self-contained sedimentary system. So we can actually look at the whole system, both sedimentary, sedimentologically and also tectonically, because it's relatively small. So this is zooming in on the Corinth Rift, and you can see where it's located um, in the Aegean. I'm just going to change the pointer later. OK, so this is our, our location. And this box is showing you the primary faults. The main faults are the sort of more solid um, black lines. These are the active faults today. So you can see there's a sort of series of um, faults along the southern margin of the, the marine gulf. Uh, but there are also faults offshore um, and some older faults onshore. You can also see here the sites, the three drill sites that we drilled. So these three circles. So prior to drilling, um, we'd actually done a considerable amount of work using marine geophysical data, so seismic reflection data offshore, collected um, over several decades. And you can see that it's a really dense network. This lower diagram, bottom left, shows you all of the different profiles that we have. So pretty close spacing. And so we're able to map out the faults and the Sinrift stratigraphy very carefully. There are also um, some shallow piston cores that were available prior to drilling. So, in, so prior to drilling, we were able to integrate all of these data and have a sort of a, a network of all of the faults, all of the stratigraphic horizons and different units well established. So we were ready for drilling. And in fact, only a small number of deeper boreholes were needed to correlate around the entire rift basin, which is pretty unusual. So I, uh, there have been several phases of rifting over this sort of five million year or so period. Um, and the modern Gulf of Corinth was established in the sort of middle of those three phases. And we think, you know, about two and a half or so million years ago, again, these are dates that were prior to drilling. Um, so you can see that there's sort of a shift um, actually northwards um, as well as some sort of changing in the width of the rift through time. Um, and that is in, indeed correct. And I'll show you some results from that. And probably that is related to the fact that we have the subducting African plate um, beneath this area. And that's probably driving <coughs> some of this sort of northward and shift of the rift. So we had some idea of possible ages from onshore age information and some estimates from offshore prior to drilling. But one of the main aims of drilling was to establish the chronology of this rifting. So I mentioned that we have some deposits onshore, and this is what we can see in two different parts of the onshore rift. This is on the southern margin of the Gulf of Corinth. So because the faults, as I mentioned, the whole sort of rift has shifted northwards, that results in faults stepping into the hanging wall of the previous fault and then uplifting the previous sort of subsiding section. So you have um, some hanging wall deposits that were in the, in the basin um, that are then uplifted and exposed. So we can see in the top image, um, an example of a fan delta that's actually of the order of 800 to 1,000 meters thick. So this is the deposit that was forming in the hanging wall of one of the active faults, and now it's been uplifted and exposed. In the central gulf, we see slightly finer grained, more sort of subtle um, deposits, um, still deltaic, um, but these are slightly different in their, in their composition. So we have some information on shore, um, but it is fairly limited, particularly in terms of chronology. So I mentioned that we're at this sort of uh, sea level um, location. Um, so we can actually um, see how sea level fluctuations have interacted with the basin. And early on, it was noticed um, that the seismic reflection data seemed to show sort of alternating um, changes in physical properties, which you can see most starkly on this sort of right-hand image. And it was interpreted as representing um, as sea level rose and fell. We had a change in an open marine basin to more of a sort of lake situation. 
And this was tested by shallow piston cores just for the most recent glacial interglacial and seemed to confirm this. But again, we didn't have this longer term confirmation. And we know that there are sills to the basin, both in the west and the east, and these have likely um, restricted um, access into the basin. Today, it is more or less sort of fully marine. So in the most recent phase, you can actually see in the seismic data here, we've sort of got two different units and this alternation is happening in this most recent phase. Um, so it was suggested that this was when we've established this sort of repeated connection to the open ocean, but potentially earlier on, that was not the case and we we're probably sitting above sea level. So there have been the, these interpretations and as a result, a sort of tentative time scale had been put to the um, sim sediments and the stratigraphy and you can see that here there are actually some different opinions um, and again that's hence the need for chronology and actually drilling and sampling the materials so there were lots of reasons to go ahead and um, put in a drilling proposal it's quite a long process it took us about um, 10 years to get to the point from putting in the proposal and actually going ahead and drilling in 2017 um, but in the end we were able to drill at three different sites which I've shown you the locations of so we had um, several main aims or two primary aims and, over, and the overarching goal was to get a sort of a high resolution um, chronology um, and sedimentary sequence um, from the Sinra sediments that would enable us to first of all look at the fault and rift evolution of this very active and young continental rift and we were very hopeful we could do this at very high resolution so both in time on the sort of thousands of years to tens of thousands of year time scale and on you know a few kilometers spatial scale and also to look at surface processes in active rifts so this idea of how um, the tectonics and climate interact to affect um, surface processes and sedimentation again on this very high resolution time scale we're also going to get um, very uh, well constrained slip rates of faults helping us to understand the hazard the natural hazard and also hopefully get some information about um, quaternary paleoclimate and paleoenvironment of this contrasting semi-isolated basin. So as I said, we drilled three sites. Um, we were using something called a mission-specific platform, which is usually used when you can't access um, the basin using the conventional ship. So you may have heard of the Joides Resolution, which was the is the main um, drill ship. And this was unable to access because of low bridges. So we used a slightly different geotechnical vessel and we drilled and cored and logged in late 2017 with just a small science party on board. And then um, a few months later, we had all of the science party together in Germany, in Bremen, and we spent one month analyzing the cores and the logs. We were able to reach up to about 700 meters below seafloor. We had very good core recovery and we also were logging um, at two sites. So nearly two kilometers of section poured all together. This is the, the ship um, in the port of Corinth um, during the expedition. And then on the bottom left, you can see the participants offshore. And then the bottom right, you can see the participants um, onshore. So we only had a, a small number of people offshore. OK, so we'll have a look at some of the results now. Um, and I've tried to sort of separate things in, in terms of uh, different um, topics so that we don't keep jumping back and forth. So we'll start off with the sort of sedimentology and the paleo environment and then move on to the tectonics part. So we'll first of all look at site 78 and 79 in the main basin. So this was the first site and we were targeting here this sort of more condensed section on a horse block. Um, within the basin. And here you, you can, for the first time, also see the structure. I'll show you some examples of the structure later. Um, but we have the sort of the main fault in the south here, um, but that there are other faults, particularly around this horse block. So we were drilling here, um, the most recent phase of drilling in the <laughs> sediments in here, but also aiming to get down into this lower unit as well as much as possible to get the earlier rift history. And then in this slide 79, um, we were trying to look at a bit more an expansion. Um, so this was the, the drilling at that particular site. So I'll show you some results from both of those, particularly focusing on the most recent phase. 
So this is um, the first of those sites, Site 78, um, you can see on the left. And the first thing to note is, indeed, we did find this sort of alternating um, environment from predominantly marine to predominantly non-marine. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. Um, the second thing to note is that the sediments in general are very fine grained. So on shore, we find quite coarse grained sediments, but not too far offshore, we've gone into very fine grained um, mud dominated deposits. And in general, we see uh, deep water, thin bedded, turbiditic and hemipelagic sediments. So in the upper unit, um, as I said, we can see this alternation. So it is indeed correct. And that alternation does continue to, to depth um, to the unit boundary. Um, in the marine sections, they tend to be dominated more by homogeneous mud with quite a lot of bioturbation, and marine microfossils are relatively abundant. And then in the sort of uh, glacial periods that we infer, the low stand period, low stand sea level periods, we see more um, thinly bedded sediments and some laminated sediments, um, so less bioturbation. And non marine microfossils are moderate to abundant, but there are also some marine microfossils present as well. So it's not a truly freshwater environment, it's something in between. And in fact, even in the marine sections, it's not, not probably fully marine. Um, and some very interesting um, assemblages, I'm not a microfossil expert, but some very interesting uh, diatoms, um, probably representing fairly stressed conditions in these sort of more isolated conditions. And in the lower unit, um, Non-marine um, uh, microfossils are dominating. There's occasional hints of some marine um, incursions. Um, but interestingly, it's actually fairly homogeneous bioturbated mud, a little bit more like the marine deposits above. But generally, because of the non-marine environment, we're expecting here that the rift is sitting probably above sea level or maybe very shallow cells. Interestingly, in the above unit, but as we go between these marine and sort of isolated um, subunits, we get some very interesting transitions. So often sort of laminated sediments are, are quite common, um, and you can see an example of those. And there's been quite a lot of um, work, both sedimentologically and paleontologically, to try and look at what happens during these transitions. These are still some other core examples, um, just an example of some thin, fine-grained um, turbidites. Um, there are fairly rare um, slumps and um, debris flow deposits, so some evidence of slumping, but it's not very common. And that's actually quite interesting, considering this is an area where earthquakes are fairly frequent and you'd expect maybe collapse of the um, uh, margins of the basin would be quite common. So sorry, there's a lot of text on here, um, but we tried to uh, put together some of these different results and also looked at um, the rate of sediment accumulation in the basin. Um, so this is a bit of a summary from a paper that we published in 2019. So looking at this interaction and fluctuations um, between these glacial and interglacial periods. So first of all, the sediment properties are very distinctive between these um, marine and isolated subunits. And we've got very varied, um, quite complicated um, assemblages of the different microfossils. Um, reflecting, you know, and, and much more than just these two sort of end member um, environments that I've mentioned. Prior to about 335,000 years ago, which is here, um, it looks as if maybe the sills may have been higher and we're getting more limited marine incursions. Um, in terms of the sediment accumulation rates in the basin, they go up to about three to four millimetres a year, which is very high, and they're highest in these glacial periods when it was an isolated basin. Um, and then we have reduced sediment accumulation rates during the marine interglacial periods, and that as much as two to seven times lower, which is interesting. We have some palynology data, and that suggests that this change in sedimentation rate is due to changes in vegetation on the flanks of the rifts and changes in erosion. So in the interglacial periods, we have mixed forests, Whereas in the glacial, much more open grassland, which can lead to more extensive erosion of sediment, um, bringing more sediment into the basin. There's a difference in the Holocene, which you can see up here, this right hand band is representing that sedimentation rate. The Holocene is, is a deviation here. 
Um, and we think that's probably due to human intervention over the last 4,000 years in terms of deforestation, increasing um, erosion and sediment flux into the basin. An important point coming back to the tectonics here is actually throughout all of this, even with these very high sedimentation rates, the, the basin is still underfilled. Um, so that tells you that the tectonic substance, even with these very high sediment supply rates, still is outweighing um, the sediment and the erosion in the sediment underfill. So very high subsidence and tectonic rates. So these are some nice little cartoons um, that just show you how um, people are envisioning um, the, the basin through these marine, these sort of um, isolated lake type environments, and then the sort of transitional period. And this is coming from um, a paper that was published by Go Rob Gawthorpe and colleagues um, a couple of years ago. So in the marine basin, um, we've got these low sediment accumulation rates, also a lower frequency of turbidites and lower sand input as well. So this, this is inferred to be related to the vegetation on land and reduced erosion. In the basin, it looks as if we've got probably overturning and mixing, as you might expect, even in a sort of fairly narrow basin, and oxidation of bottom waters. That leads to this sort of diverse um, assemblage and quite a lot of bioturbation in those shallow sediments. Whereas in the more sort of isolated basin, and you can see in the, the cartoon, it's isolated from the open ocean, um, which is sitting lower um, than the basin itself. Uh, we've got high sediment input um, due to the change in vegetation. Um, probably some stratification in the basin and oxygen depletion at the base. And so sort of less, more diversity, um, but, you know, a more limited um, assemblage of, of um, organisms on the seafloor and potentially even a sort of stressed seafloor environment. And then this sort of transitional phase, which I didn't mention, has some quite interesting laminations, including um, some calcite and aragonite valve-like laminations. Um, and there are some suggestions here as to what the basin might be like, um, maybe some stratification. Um, uh, but because these are sort of more limited, we have uh, less knowledge and we need to sort of do more research into this, this particular phase. So I'm now going to just show you the, the final site in the east. This part of the rift we know um, is extending at a, a lower rate and has um, a smaller um, accumulation of sediments. So we know it's a little bit different. And we are also interested in that it might have shown us an earlier phase of rifting because there's a part of the rift on shore that's much older. So we were looking to see if we could find that as well. So this site was partly to try and extend things back further in time and also to see what the variation is along the rift. And indeed, we did find some interesting things here. Um, so in addition to those sort of marine and lake type environments, we also found terrestrial environments here. So if we look at the, the sequence, we go first of all through the alternating marine isolated during the most recent phase. Then we get into the sort of more isolated phase that we saw before. But then below that, we actually have terrestrial, alluvial fan and fluvial deposits. And then below that, we return to probably a shallow, possibly marine environment below that. And then finally, a basal conglomerate. So a really big range here. And we think that this earlier phase that we have down in unit four from some, some nanofossils um, suggests this could be as old as late Miocene, Pliocene. And, and we've actually got some nice um, assemblages showing this sort of transition from the lake, possibly um, shallow marine environments into terrestrial. So we have these shallow marine assemblages. So really quite varied. You might be interested in the color here so most of the, the rocks here are limestones with carbonates. But in this particular location, we've actually got some ophiolitic material on shore. So what we're seeing here is ultramafic rocks that are being eroded and feeding this fan, um, and hence the, the difference in colour. Okay. So um, we're still working on a chronology, um, trying to put that together. Um, but uh, we've been able to sort of correlate between the three different sites that you can see here and with the sea level curve and with oxygen isotope stages. And we've also come up with some, um, some, some ideas of the chronology, but this is ongoing work. So first of all, we've got a pretty good idea of the timing of the transition between the most recent phase of rifting and the penultimate one, which is here. So that's around 770,000 years. 
we also were able to take what we learned at this site, Site 78, um, and extrapolate down to the base of the sedimentary section in the seismic lines. And from that, we can estimate that the onset of rifting in the Gulf of Corinth, so probably that the beginning of the second phase, the middle phase, is two and a half to two million years ago. We're still working on the chronology, and in time, I think we'll be able to get to that sort of thousands of years, um, potentially, um, and certainly already we have tens of thousands of years resolution. So we're using a number of different things, um, including um, uranium thorium dating of the ragonite needles, tephra chronology, as you might expect in this region, we have some tephra, um, hopefully trying some RPI, paleomagnetic relative paleo intensity. Um, we're using ostracods. Um, and we can do some oxygen isotope dating, but only in the marine intervals, of course. So we're still, this is um, ongoing work. So now just to, for the last part of the talk, I wanted to say more about the tectonics and the structure. So even before we had drilled, um, we knew quite a lot about the variability of the rift structure in space and time. So these different profiles are from west at the top to east um, at the bottom. And they're showing you how the rift structure is, is varying. So, for example, the polarity, so the dominance of north or south dipping faults dominating the structure has changed in time, but it also changes in space as you go along the rift. Um, it's actually gradually moving to a more sort of simplified system where we have north dipping faults dominating. It also has variations between a more symmetrical rift and an asymmetrical rift, so a graben versus a half graben, also changing in time and space. Um, but again, more moving more now to more of a half graben um, asymmetry. And also the distribution of strain, as in how many faults are taking up the extension, is also different. So we have more faults in the west and a more sort of simple system in the east. And some of that may be related to pre-existing um, structure and um, lithology being different between the West and the East. So even again before um, drilling, we were able to put together um, the different horizons and different units relative to the faults and look at the thicknesses of those sediments in time. So that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing an isopack, so thickness of the deposits um, between the earlier phase of rifting and the more recent phase of rifting below. And you can see they're quite different. Um, so the first one, we've got two different depocenters in blue, um, and then those merge into one big depocenter in the more recent phase. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about what's driving that. So we're seeing that change on a sort of 500,000 year to a million year time scale. Um, so quite a big change, which is ultimately related to the fault uh, faults uh, being active. So in the earlier phase, we've got both sort of, um, these are south dipping faults and north dipping faults being active. Um, and now we have mostly these north dipping faults along the southern edge of the rift being um, active. And these faults are linking together um, to create this linked single depocenter. So this was before drilling. Um, and this is updating those um, maps and the timings um, to using the drilling data. So in addition to the chronology, we also from drilling have velocity data, which means we can make much more accurate changes from time to depth between the seismic data and you know, actual real thicknesses. So here now you can also see some detail. Um, we've got the first of the rift phases, but now we're breaking down the most recent phase into several different time periods. And you can see in detail how this depocenter is gradually merging together. And you can also see sort of differences in thicknesses over time. So we have these, as we get into this most recent phase, we've got that sort of change in um, the polarity or the dominance of north versus south dipping faults. And we've got linkage of this fault system along the rift margin, which is a, a common process or expected to happen in a rift. Um, and now we can also compare these thicknesses with some of the models for sediment supply from the onshore part of the rift as well. 
So a bit more detail on the faulting. So just a, a couple more slides related to that. So this shows the individual faults. And what you see on the right is a map of them with blue being north dipping faults, red being south dipping faults. And their thickness represents how fast they're moving, their slip rates. And then on the left, um, so you can see again how this sort of this border fault in blue is building up, um, linking together and building up its slip over time. And then on the left, what you're looking at is a profile along the rift and we've added together um, the sort of the rate of movement on all of the faults across the rift at different places. So we start up here, and again, we've got blue versus red for the north and south dipping faults. So here, and, and the yellow line represents the sort of average um, throw rate, the average rate. There's a couple of things to look at. First of all, you can see here, we have sort of blue and red being fairly equal. So equal sort of north and south dipping, a bit more symmetrical. And then gradually blue begins to dominate. And so this is the north dipping faults dominating. And then the other thing that you can see is this yellow bar, particularly when we go from B to C to D, is increasing in rate. And this is an acceleration of rates on the faults over time, particularly over the last 500,000 years. But it really takes off from um, the last 300,000 years to present. And I'll show you that in, in the cartoon in a moment. So this is a, a consequence of this border fault system taking over. Um, and as it links together, the slip rate tends to increase. And again, that's something that's been modeled before and seen in other systems. And then the rate really, really takes off. So here's some cartoons just summarizing that um, before I finish. So our first stage tectonically is that we've got um, sort of a more of a symmetrical system, but we're starting to change that. Um, as we transfer from these south dipping faults to the north dipping faults. And then when we get to 300,000 years ago, uh, we're starting to link together these faults and accelerate their slip rates. And then as they link even more kinematically, um, that in rate increases even further. So we can see the sort of 300,000 year point here um, and increasing the rate as we go on. But it's also meaning we're also starting to get some sort of flexure of the other margin and some down warp that we can see as well. So this is sort of just showing you um, the idea of the average slip rate of the faults um, through time. And you can really see this acceleration. And just out of interest from the hazard perspective, we have some faults here that are moving at up to seven millimeters a year, which is a really very high, high slip rate for a normal fault. Okay, so just to um, sum up for you, um, so the Corinth Rift is, is very unusual, I would say unique in terms of it's got this unprecedented geophysical data set and also now geological data set, both offshore from drilling and onshore for unraveling early rift processes. We have now from drilling the first sedimentary record of this length and resolution in an active young rift basin as it's connecting to the open ocean basin. And it's also given us a new record of environmental changes in a semi-enclosed basin. So interesting for comparison to places like the Black Sea. We have an age model that's constraining the timings and rates, and we can get that to very high resolution, potentially some thousands of years. We're looking at how tectonic subsidence, sea level and climate interact to generate these really big changes in basin environment and sediment accumulation. It looks as if the Climatic change dominates on tens of thousands of years timescales, whereas tectonics at hundreds of thousands of year timescales. The sediment accumulation rates are up to seven times higher during glacial periods, and that's got some real implications for other um, rift basins. And we can see in detail how the rift structure has evolved from more symmetrical to asymmetrical, and how depicenters simplify and merge with time, and how this border fault system has developed and linked very rapidly with slip rates changing quite quite dramatically over tens to hundreds of thousands of year timescales. And I shall stop there. I'm sorry if I went over just a little bit. Um, just some acknowledgements to colleagues and institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. You got uh, applauses here from the public. Um, and I open the podium for questions from the audience or okay. virtually from the people on Zoom. 
Well, until you think on a question, I have one. Uh, you mentioned that um, uh, in a millennial time scale, you have a transition from, in an orbital time scale, you have transition from um, marine to lake and then lake to marine, right? Yeah. Yep. Now, you mentioned over there, I don't remember which age it was, but fresh water lake. Well, is that your question or shall I let yeah, you Yeah, <laughs> how come it become fresh? <laughs> No, well, I, I, th I mean, this is not my expertise and um, exactly, but my understanding is we never reach fresh water. And that's why we're trying to use this sort of isolated, semi-isolated term, because there, there are always some marine microfossils present, at least in this most recent phase, as we alternate. Um, so it, it seems to be not quite fresh water. Some sort of brackish, um, semi-isolated lake seems to better describe it. So even if it's not, there. yeah, even if it's, it's not semi-isolated and it's actually an actual lake, mm. it can be saline or brackish. Yes. That's not yeah. a problem. And it's easy to yeah. check by strontium isotopes, you know. Yeah, or that's, that's a good other... point. I don't think anybody is doing that. I uh, Yeah, I will pass that on. Yeah. Okay. Who is the group doing that, actually? Well, we do have some geochemists, but also I imagine some of the paleontologists could probably get involved with that. In England, in the UK? People are, there's a whole variety of people in, some in the UK, some in Greece, some in the US. Um, yeah, in a variety of different locations. Oh. But yes, nobody has done strontium isotopes yet. Good okay, point. cool. Okay, we have a qu another question from the audience. Hi, Lisa. Uh, it's Isaac. Uh, I'm sorry, probably cannot see me. But uh, hi. hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for a great talk. It's very, it's a fascinating pl place, this current place, and, and it really shows a lot of new stuff. Uh, can you say something about how do you envision the crustal scale risking process uh, corresponding? What does the crustal scale? scale process corresponding to what you've been showing. Because you've shown us the very upper upper crust near surface uh, faulting. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I mean, there is quite, obviously quite a lot more known than I have shown. Um, so we know um, something about how, the, how much the crust has thinned. Um, and and actually, this is it's still a fairly immature rift. Um, that is complicated slightly by the fact that there are some previous um, changes to crustal thickness in the area, and because it's quite narrow, and I would say actually fairly limited data. So there are some uncertainties there. So we do know something though about um, crustal thickness changes and crustal thinning. But I think because of the scale of it, it's quite hard to get. It will always be quite hard to get some get detail of that and how that relates to the faults. There's also quite a lot that's been done um, based on passive seismology, and and we're hoping to do some more on that. So we have an idea of fault structure at depth from from small earthquakes from micro seismicity. Um, but again, there are some some questions still remain. So some people have suggested that there are maybe some low angle detachments that these higher angle faults solve into. Some people suggest they're not. Um, so again, quite a lot of different debates going on. But yeah, we do have some more information about the sort of the geometry of the faults. Um, obviously, much of that is about the present day rather than going back through time, which is what we can do um, from the sort of shallower crustal information. And, um, and then, as I said, yeah, crustal thickness gives you that very broad scale, but we probably can't resolve much about that compares with the sort of more temp longer term history that we've got here for the shallow depths. Um, but we did have some plans as part of this project with some um, colleagues to do some modeling um, in terms of what we see in the sort of shallow crustal structure from the faults that we image um, in term and in terms of um, rotation and tilt and down warping that I mentioned. Um, so there are some some ideas to do some some modeling work to see how that might relate 
can fit into what we see at that. I don't know if that answers your question. I guess my question, uh, partly, uh, my question really uh, refers, since you, you've been showing us structural evolution, I was I was referring to the structural evolution uh, uh, type questions like simple shear versus uh, pure shear in the in the evolution of the rift. Uh, is there a lateral motion that is involved here? Because it almost looks it almost looks like it, these are segments on a on a on our mm -hmm. left lateral uh, Dead Sea uh, fault system that that rotate and, and merge. That we see similar kind of things in the dead sea, for example. Um, so, yeah, on your on your sort of second point about you know any sort of lateral motion or sort of strike slip motion, they look to be fairly sort of pure normal slip these faults, and that kind of comes through also in earthquake vocal mechanisms. Um, even in the the steps, the sort of transfer zones between the individual segments still seems to be the case although you know i think that a closer look is is needed in terms of sort of pure shear versus simple shear i mean i think that's partly where some of these detachment ideas come in and at what point does a detachment develop in a simple shear rift system and some people would argue that that's happening here particularly also the sort of asymmetry that we see um it may be that the rift is too young to be showing that kind of behavior um so and and personally, I, I'm on I'm on I'm on the camp of not necessarily being convinced of the detachment model yet. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. We have another question here. Hi, thank you for for this talk. Very interesting. Uh, my name is Vital Buchan, and I work on fluidites in the Red Sea. And I also, in a way, a similar tectonic setting and laid boundary. And I wonder if, if you have any fluidites in your sediment cores and do their, their distribution or appearance changes with time. Yes, sorry, I did mention that, but maybe it wasn't very clear. Yeah, there are definitely um, turbidites. They tend to be quite thin, fine grained turbidites. And what we see is they seem to be more frequent in these glacial low stand periods. Okay. So that probably fits maybe with um, this sort of reduced vegetation and greater erosion. I mean, we've also got more exposure of the shelf. Well, probably <laughs> during those those low stands. And that might also lead to sort of more failure of the of the slopes that increases the turbidite frequency. Okay. Yeah, I did show some, um, I can go back if you want, but I did show a couple of images of those, but yeah, there's quite well, a nice I, series. I saw the images, I wonder if you uh, created the record, and do you think that what is the trigger for those turbidites is it connected to the tectonic activity? Oh, right, yes, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's been discussed um, in more recent times. Um, the, the current actually is one of the, one of the places where early cable break, break studies were done in the 50s and 60s, I think. There's a really nice paper um, on, on that. Um, I'm sure some of these turbidity currents, some of these gravity flows are triggered by earthquakes, but it looked like from some of these more recent studies that actually there are more than can be explained by earthquakes. And therefore it's probably a combination of earthquake triggers and sort of winter storm um, triggers as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Beverly? Um, well, I, I was going to ask something about the turbidites as well, actually, but um, you sort of, you answered it. First of all, it's an amazing study. I mean, amazing data, really, really interesting to, you know, the scales are huge. Um, and, and you mentioned that you haven't really gotten down to the <clears throat> sub millennials. So I imagine, you know, once you get to that kind yeah. of um, scale, it's going to give even more information. Um, this isn't, isn't really a question, but to add to the sort of, I was going to ask you about whether you see the turbidites more in the, you know, semi-marine or, you know, the semi-enclosed or in the marine. The other thing you might want to consider, and I think when the, when the resolution increases, this will be more clear, is also if you have lower salinity, you're going to be able to mm -hmm. produce more turbidites because obviously the, you know, the, the level of, of, uh, the level of load yeah. that's going to be required 
to create yes. the turbidite is going to be different. Yeah. So that it, yeah. it might not necessarily be a matter of changing uh turbidite like about like numbers, but it could actually just be the con the water conditions and the salinity is changing how much of it is floating on the yeah. surface versus how much can overcome and actually yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure it's something that my sedimentology colleagues like Rob Gawthorpe and others have thought of. Um, I was just yeah. looking back to the cartoons I showed came from Rob's paper. I mean, they were actually developed by Mary Ford, who you may also know. Um, and I'm just having a look to see if they had noted that point. It's possible that that isn't in the paper. But yeah, that's a good good point. Yeah, you've got different different environment in the basin that will affect the flows as well. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. I think that there are no more questions around. Well, thank you very much. They're really good questions. Really, thank you very much. Would, okay. would you like to be uh, in the loop of notifications from our side on the future events? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you very much. And again, looking forward to meeting you. Yes, yes. Okay. Hope to see you in person soon. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Have Bye. a good day. Bye -bye. You too. Bye. Bye.